Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone attending today. My name is Philip Hoddell and I'm the chairman here at Burkett Long. I'm delighted to be able to introduce today's Wednesday webinar. As you may know, Burkett Long are offering regular webinar, webinars on a wide range of legal topics. Future subjects will include a construction law update, a session on statutory wills, what they are and when you need them, and some guidance on the duties and responsibilities of trustees. If you're interested in any of our webinars, then please sign up at www.burkittlong.co.uk forward slash events. Now today we're delivering an employment law update. It will be presented by Julie Temple, a partner and head of employment at Burkitt Long. Julie has also been recently recognised by the prestigious Legal 500 publication as a leading lawyer in her field. She'll be taking questions at the end of what promises to be a fascinating talk, and so I will hand over to her without further ado. Well, you went off script there, Philip, mentioning Legal 500 and no pressure. So, thank you. Um, right, so let me just share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that. Thumbs up. Excellent. Right. So um, thank you, Philip. As Philip says, I'm Julie Temple and I'm head of the BLHR and employment team here at Burkitt Long. And I'm very pleased to be presenting today's Wednesday webinar on employment and HR updates. I'm equally pleased that it started and I'm not having to keep my head, my my eye on the um, on the headlines to see if anything's going to be changing in terms of what I'm going to be relaying to you today. Um, just in terms of what we're going to be covering, just a quick slide on a, a timeline, a quick look back, what's in the wind, so to speak, so things that might be coming up. A case review, I'm going to be looking at hopefully three cases in particular today, an opportunity for you to ask questions and I'm confident there's going to be no shortage of them and I'll do my best to get through as many as possible and then I'll share with you my contact details if um, if you do wish to get in touch for any reason. Now, hopefully on your screen somewhere, you will find a Q&A box. If you do have any questions to ask through the course of today, either about today or indeed anything else, then please do feel free to pop your question in there. And as I say, we'll do our best to, to get to them. As I said, um, there has been a little bit of change in the run up to today. So um, certainly as of this morning, everything that I'm about to say is is accurate. Um, whether that has remained the case throughout the course of today, I'm I'm not sure. As I say, I've been a little bit fearful of, of looking at headlines and so on and so forth. So having said that, we do publish things on our website and via our newsletter if there is anything to update you on. So very quickly in terms of a timeline, um, this isn't a definitive timeline of everything in the in the world of employment law and HR, but it is a timeline just in relation to the items that I am going to be talking about today. And, and as usual, a recording will go up and you'll be able to flick backwards and forwards if you if you wish and um, have a look at the slide in a in a little bit more. A little bit more detail. So moving into the detail, looking back um, across some of the things that have, have changed and, and perhaps some key changes you need to be aware of and, and just dust off and remind yourself of is in relation to fit notes. So since the 6th of April of this year, fit notes are able to have been signed electronically. Um, this is all aimed at trying to help the, the workload of, of, of GPs and, and process things a little bit more quickly. And linked into that, we have um, a number of other um, professions that are now 
um, sanctioned to be able to sign fit notes. And this is all with effect from the 1st of July. So doctors, as it has been the case, registered nurses, occupational therapists, pharmacists in some instances and physiotherapists in some instances can all now sign fit notes. So if you are, I mean, I'd be interested to know actually if you have been getting fit notes through other than from doctors, um, you know, don't be surprised if you do see someone signing other than a doctor. Um, worth checking to see if they are qualified as such to sign. And again, hopefully that should alleviate some of the pressure and equally help you to understand the position with the employee and help you to, to make the right decisions. Now, that change from the 1st of July was accompanied by a detailed guide by the Department of Work and Pensions. And that was catchily titled, Getting the Most Out of the Fit Note, Guidance for Healthcare Professionals. Now, that you might think I'm a little bit sad, but that's quite an interesting read from to understand the pers perspective of the individual who might be signing off a particular fit note and the sorts of things that they they have to take into account. More importantly, from your perspective, is a updated and updated guide that was issued on the 13th of October. So just last week happened to be the day that I was doing my reading in preparation for this. So quite pleased that I, I caught that as I was as I was getting prepared. Um, you might not be entirely surprised about the title of this one, but getting the most out of the fit note guidance for employers and line managers. Now, even if you've been used to seeing fit notes, dealing with fit notes, dealing with absences of employees, it is a really useful guide to have a read through. If you're relatively new to the area of HR or you're working with line managers who perhaps might not be familiar, I would strongly recommend you have a read through, remind yourselves or point your line manager in, in that direction. They look through the sorts of things as an employer you should be thinking about um, when you do get a, a fit note and the sorts of things, you know, steps that you could be taking um, in relation to a particular employee and in particular circumstances. So it's quite short, definitely worth downloading and, and having on your desk or, you know, as a shortcut on your, your internet, um, whichever search engine you choose to 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 use have that there and, and refer to it as and as and when you might need it really useful guide as I'm as I say the other thing really that's changed specifically from a legislative perspective is from the 1st of October the right to work checks that we have become relatively familiar through um, with through the through the COVID COVID period when face to face verification hasn't been as practical as as might otherwise be the case and recognising the fact that a lot of businesses are bringing individuals into their business who are working either wholly remotely or perhaps um, in, a, in a hybrid way and we're not seeing them as regularly. We've now got a more flexible right to work um, checks for employees which should be being undertaken, of course, before individuals start their employment. So we have the option for some cases to do an online check by the Home Office online checking service. We have the option of doing in-person manual checks against original documents and then also an identification document validation using in hard to get your lips around. Identification document validation technology, IDVT for short, um, which a large number of, of providers are, are offering. I'm sure you're all familiar with the fact that um, this is an important part of onboarding individuals into an organisation. It is something that should be done across the board and it is something that should be done 
in relation to every individual and we, we shouldn't be cherry picking who we carry out these particular checks for on the basis of, of, of where they are perceived or do originate from. Reason for that is there can be penalties imposed of up to £20,000 for each individual who is found to be illegally employed and there are um, also um, other yeah, no, it's it's the penalty and it's it's criminal criminal sanction. Um, so as I say, something best to be avoided. In terms of the adjusted checks that have been carried out throughout the COVID period, um, there has been clarity that there isn't a need to go back and carry out retrospective verification, so in-person checking of original original documents. So that's kind of where where we are in terms of the, the lay of the land at the moment. Now we move on to things that are in in the wind. So obviously with there's a there's an awful lot of things going on in the in the world at the moment and I am going to try my very best not to make any political statements whilst we go through go through this particular part of the Wednesday the Wednesday webinar. Now we have been expecting quite a few things to be coming into the process following following Brexit and as we as a, as, as a, a nation decide what bits we wish to retain, what bits we wish to we wish to change and of course employment and HR isn't going to be you know, there's going to be no exception to that so far as so far as that is is concerned. However, we do have a lot of our laws that do come from um, Europe. So perhaps, you know, the, the, the employment and HR world might be affected to a, to a greater extent. So starting with uh, GDPR data protection, um, we had already started along the road of looking at what the GDPR Data Protection Act of, of 2018 was going to look like post Brexit and the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill was winding its way through through Parliament. However, the day before the uh, new Prime Minister was announced, so the 5th of September, I believe that was pressed pause on and during the Conservative Party conference on the 3rd of October, the announcement was made that the GDPR is going to be replaced with a bespoke UK system um, and that may or may not follow the, the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill and, and that draft that is already in, in place. So, so far as that's concerned, really all I can say is watch this space and as I mentioned earlier as a team, we will be watching that space on your behalf and publishing updates as we as we go. I'm tending to take the approach of not not getting involved in 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 too much of the, the conjecture of someone said this, so therefore it might be and, and looking and waiting for the for something a little bit more, little bit more definitive, which I think is hopefully a little bit more helpful and minimises the noise that's going into your inboxes and things that you're having to to think about. But as and when we get something definitive, we will we will be publishing some information. Now, the, the GDPR Data Protection Act position links in with what's being called the Brexit Freedoms Bill or the catchily titled Retained EU Law Brackets Revocation and Reform Close Brackets Bill that was published on the 22nd of September. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you've probably seen quite a lot of noise around this already. But in very simple terms, what the Brexit Freedoms Bill, as I'm going to refer to it, broadly does, is it has a long stop date of the 31st of December 2023 for the revocation of the majority of EU derived legislation. There is an option 
in some some of those uh, in respect of some of that legislation for that deadline to be extended to the 23rd of June 2026. Why that date? Because that I think is the I think it's the tenth anniversary of the um, of the announcement of the um, Brexit referendum, and ultimately what that means is potentially we will see a huge amount of EU law disappear off the statute books. What I'm actually expecting is between now and the 31st of December 2023 ne next year, or indeed some point in the future before the 23rd of June 2026, is various new legislation being published to deal specifically with laws that we want to retain or that we are looking at, 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 at tweaking or completely wholesale wholesale changing. Now, from a HR perspective, what that means is that we could see the likes of TUPI, the transfer of undertakings, protection of employment regulations changing or being revoked entirely. Working time regulations, long, long, long overdue being reviewed in, in my view, and hopefully that will get the well-deserved attention that it needs. Part-time workers regulations, fixed term workers regulations, agency worker regulations, equal pay, um, and also linked in with what I was just saying earlier, the GDPR. Um, it's frankly impossible to know where we're going to land between this December next year or indeed June 2016. For my money, I think we will see a, the vast majority of legislation that we are used to and familiar with becoming the um, standalone UK law with perhaps some some changes and an evolution over over a period of time. But who knows? Who knows? Um, and clearly it will depend on what is going on in government at any particular time. And again, that's a potentially changeable, changeable feast, and I make no further comment. Um, all I can say again is watch this space. Now, there are some early indications as to what we might, hold on, let's make sure I've got the right slide up, what we might be looking forward to in the coming the coming months and, and years. The Bill of Rights, similar to the GDPR position, was in the process of going through through Parliament um, with a view to repealing the Human Rights Act and introducing new legislation. But again, that was paused on the 12th of September. Um, the mini budget um, or growth plan, depending on how you choose to refer to it, um, in so far as HR and employment law was concerned, did announce that the off payroll working rules and IR35 um, respectively introduced in 2017 and 2021, delayed from 2020, were going to be repealed from the 6th of April next year. And Jeremy Hunt um, announced yesterday um, our new Chancellor, that that is now not going to be the case. So, as you were, is is the simple position there. Broadly speaking, what does that mean? Um, it means that the end user, the business who is engaging with an individual through an intermediary company to um, get the benefit of their services, is going to have to assess that individual for their employment status and in turn tax status and take various steps in terms of relaying that information through the through the chain. So I'm I'm afraid if any of you were pleased at that particular item of the announcement in the mini, mini budget and began to work through what that meant, um, I'm afraid it's a press pause and and reverse for the time being. Um, I do believe Liz Truss did say that that was one of her campaign pledges, so we might find that does remain um, and comes back onto, onto the agenda in the future. Now, 
also during the Conservative Party conference, um, Liz Truss did announce that she is looking at removing some of the red tape for businesses and looking at hiring the bar for exemptions for small businesses from um, 50 or 250, depending on which particular article that you're reading, um, to 500. And there is noise that that is going to increase to 1000 in due course. What that means practically is um, any legislation where there is an exemption for a small business. So, for example, gender pay gap, gender pay gap reporting is required for businesses where there are 250 or more employees. It is likely that that bar could increase. Whether it's going to be retrospective in the sense of apply to the gender pay gap reporting requirements and say from a particular date, only businesses with 500 or more employees will have to undertake that task. I don't know, um, but certainly any new legislation that is under consideration, this is what we do know, any new legislation under consideration from the 3rd of October onwards of this year is going to be um, drafted with a view to there being an exemption if it's appropriate for em employers with 500 or more employees. So again, I'm afraid we have to just see how that plays, how that plays out. Now, moving on to um, Mr. Rees Mogg and um, his statements during and uh, well, he made an a, a, a statement during the, the party conference and he's reported to have made some some other comments in his role as the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industry Stat Strategy. Um, most notable is the suggestion that, and I put it like that, um, there, there will be being introduced no fault dismissals i.e. an individual um, can't bring a claim for employees who are earning more than £50,000. Um, other articles I have read have, have mooted earnings of more than £100,000 and also he's mooted the appeal of the work, the, the, the repeal of the working time regulations. Now, I have my views on the working time regulations and it does need some work in in my view. I think a total repeal is something that's not likely to to get through. Um, I'm going to decline to comment on the suggestion of a no fault dismissal. Um, but what I will say is that apparently sources of um, reliable sources from Downing Street have, have described some of the suggestions as as half baked and I'm probably best to leave that there. Um, union responses, as you might expect, have not been favourable around some of these sort of potential things that are being considered and are, in, in my description, in the wind. Um, but as I say, we will just have to watch this space. And again, you know, we will be um, publishing information when we have some firm indication of what what is being considered and what might enter the statute books in due course so by all means you know stay in touch with us um and we will do our best to keep you informed as quickly as quick quickly as we can for those of you in the public sector and i know looking through um the the, the huge list of attendees today a number of you are a consultation closed, I think yesterday, oh no, Monday, um, on public sector exit payments um, over £95,000. So just keep your eye out for the outcome of that and indeed, more importantly, any legislation that, that flows out from, excuse me, from that. So moving on from an area that I might get into hot water with and something that I'm much more comfortable talking about because it's certain um, is some guidance just uh, recently announced at the beginning of September 
ACAS has um, published some new guidance around suspending staff during suspensions at work and in a similar way to the guidance in relation to fit notes that I mentioned earlier. It is relatively speaking short, very easy to digest and a useful reference point just to double check your own kind of knowledge, reassure yourself you're taking the right steps in terms of what to think about when you are considering suspension. And I would just do a quick flag there to say really important to remember it shouldn't be a knee jerk um, and in the sense that this employee is at risk of being dismissed because of what they've done. Therefore, we must suspend to avoid the argument that um, it wasn't a gross misconduct, etc. The sort of process that you, would, you should follow when you're suspending, supporting staff during suspension with a view to their mental health um, and, and, and that's a very important um, important side of things and also looking at pay entitlements and holiday entitlements during during suspension. A couple of points just again to remind you of if you are suspending not as a knee jerk reaction, please keep it as short as possible and keep it under review. There are things that might change, which might mean the individual could be reintroduced to the workplace, perhaps in a different role, in a different team, at a different location, and also keep it as confidential as you can. If you say somebody has been suspended to the wider business or indeed to, to clients, that is going to make it more difficult for the individual to come back into the workplace, which is a possibility. And it would give rise to arguments about predetermination and, and, and things like that. So do get um, do have a look at that. And if you are deviating from anything that the ACAS guide is is recommending to you, do stop and think, why are we not doing it in the way that it, it, it's being recommended by ACAS and make a note of it and make sure you keep those, those notes to one side because if you need to refer back, you've got your, you know, in that moment, idea, thought process for why you have done what you, you have done. And I, I do find on a regular basis, it's quite difficult for some, some individuals to recall back. Um, and if you've got your notes there, then there's, there's no issue. Also, just in relation to COVID, um, I'm sure you're all seeing the headlines and you may even be seeing it within your workplace that COVID infections are are on the increase um, and also symptoms are evolving. Guidance for employers has not been updated since the 10th of June um, of, of this year. I'm not sure what position actually is in relation to the guidance that exists for individuals, but ultimately as an employer you do of course, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this after the past um, two, two and a half years, you have a duty of care to your employees to protect their health and safety in the same way as those employees have a duty to protect their colleagues health and safety, all of which together are equally important and hopefully evolve into a, a, a more healthy workplace where there's a, a, a minimised risk. But you know, do continue to keep those risk assessments and the processes and protections that you have in place, if indeed you, you have any now, make sure they are being kept under review, particularly if you are seeing an increase in individuals being absent from work through COVID or indeed other illnesses as we come into, as we come into the winter. And certainly um, anecdotally for, for, for my side of things, um, certainly within a Temple household, we've had probably the worst introduction to a to autumn from a, a, an ill health perspective than than I can I can remember with with various bouts of things going around that I, I won't go into. Um, but I, I know that there are others who are experiencing similar similar things with you know, bad colds and so on and so forth. So please do continue to keep that under review. Um, not necessarily on a daily or weekly basis, but just, you know, make sure it's refreshed as um, as needs be. 
All right. So, um, in terms of the cases, this is as many of you will have, if you've seen me do do an employment law update in the past. Cases are the, are the sort of the bit that that I really really enjoy sharing um, with with you because it's a, a good way to see how pe other people might have dealt with things and, and how to, you know, kind of address things that you might find taking place in, in your workplace and, um, you know, might be crossing your, your desk from time to time. Now, the first case I'm going to be talking about is Quinn v Sense Scotland. Now, this is a case that involves um, an allegation that somebody was dismissed um, on, in circumstances where they had long COVID and that long COVID was in turn a disability and therefore the individual had been discriminated against in, in their dismissal because of something arising from that disability, namely absence. So the, the facts of this particular case are the individual um, Quinn had been employed for less than two years and she was employed from July 2019 to July 2021. Hold on a minute, something like um, it was less than two years, so I might have got the dates wrong there. Um, she tested positive for COVID on the 11th of July 2021 and she was dismissed on the 27th of July 2021. So she'd had COVID for, well, it was around about two and a half weeks by the time that she, she was dismissed. She went into a period of isolation. She carried out a half day um, having exited that period of, of, of isolation in the office and then also worked a day in another office the day before she was she was dismissed. She experienced um, things like fatigue, shortness of breath, aches, pains, discomfort, headaches, um, what's described in the judgment as brain fog, um, and in, in brackets, feeling less mentally alert, close brackets, as well as struggles with shopping and driving. And she was no longer socialising or, or exercising, all of which, um, you know, are potential pointers towards an individual being a disabled, a disabled person. So just to recap quickly, an individual is disabled if they have a physical and mental or sorry or mental impairment so in this case covid or long covid which um she she passed the post on so to speak if there was an impairment which has an adverse effect on normal day-to-day -day activities so as i say we've gone through a list there of thing the way in which she was being impacted and links that with the next test which is it must be substantial meaning more than minor or or trivial and the tribunal in this particular case said that the impact of covid long covid on her was adverse on her day-to-day -day activities and it was substantial so she passed the post on on all of those those points as well where she failed however was on the basis that for an impairment to be a disability, it has to have lasted or be likely to last for more than more than 12 months. And as I mentioned earlier, at the point she was dismissed, she had only been suffering from the symptoms for around about two and a half, two and a half weeks. And there is, I have to say, the judgment is not the best that I've ever I've ever read and it's a little bit sketchy on on certain information including including dates in my defense um but she um the stats that are quoted I'll just summarize as to say everyone who gets covid doesn't in fact actually a small proportion of people go on to suffer from from long covid 
and as such it couldn't be said that while she had COVID it was more likely than not um, or could well occur that she would have long COVID which actually did transpire to to occur in the future so in this particular instance Quinn um, didn't succeed in a claim that she was um, discriminated against in relation to her disability. Now it's worth just mentioning a couple of things. One is it's a Scottish case, so not necessarily binding. Two, it's an employment tribunal case. So whilst it will be useful to refer to other tribunals um, in, in relation to kind of a particular argument or not, it isn't going to be isn't going to be determinative. And more importantly, particularly with disability cases, all cases are determined on their own facts. So, you know, please don't take go away and think, OK, it's fine if somebody has COVID or long COVID, we can dismiss at an early stage because it's not a disability. And of course, if somebody does have more than two years service, there's an added layer of, of um, things that you would need to need to think about as well. But just to bear that in mind, having said, you know, it doesn't mean that you should you know, you can dismiss an earlier stage. You know, if you delay, you do risk, you know, that that situation developing into something which could be deemed to be a disability. So I would strongly recommend that you 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 pause for thought on that. And if you know, if you if you do feel it's something that could be complicated or might come back and, and bite you, if I can put it like that, then please do please do speak to to your advisors um, and you know very happy to chat to you any one of the team here at Beckett Long would be be happy to chat through a particular circumstance with you so that's long Covid and disability and and um, dismissal holiday pay um, I do long for the day I don't have to talk about holiday pay um, and I've been talking about it for far too many years than I than I care to care to mention but I just wanted to briefly talk through the Harper Trust Brazel case which was published in July um, of, of this year it has gone all the way to the Supreme Court and this is now the definitive um, the defini definitive statement on on this particular position the Brazel case involved a term time only teacher who worked during term time only, didn't work during the, the school closure periods and worked varying hours during the weeks that she was she was working. The question arose as to what this particular individual was entitled to by way of holiday and also holiday holiday pay. Now, Harper Trust originally positioned it that she was entitled to 5.6 weeks and she that's what she was paid at a date um, that I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, they decided that they were going to pay her a percentage, a proportion of holiday, which was proportionate to the out the number of weeks that she was working compared to a full time a full time worker, which meant that her holiday entitlement and holiday, well, her holiday pay in particular reduced. And she wasn't particularly happy at this. And as I say, this case has gone all the way to to the Supreme Court. And I'm going to try and make it as simple as possible. If you have an individual, a worker who is engaged and on your books for an entire holiday year, what this case says is that that individual is entitled to 5.6 weeks holiday. And that is the case regardless of whether they work one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, 12 months of the year. If they are on your books as a worker, then they are, that is what they are entitled to. The other side of it, is in terms of what pay they are entitled to, that is an average over a 52 week period, ignoring any weeks where they are not receiving 
where they are not receiving pay. And if ignoring weeks they don't receive pay in a 52 week period means they don't have 52 weeks pay to take into account, you can go back a maximum of 104 or to when they started with you. So the bottom line is someone who is engaged for an entire holiday year, regardless of how much they work, are entitled to 5.6 weeks holiday. That in turn equates to 5.6 weeks as an average of their pay over a 52 week period. As I say, ignoring weeks where they don't work and going back a maximum of 104 weeks. And I, I have to say, I've seen a huge amount of sort of commentary around around it, which I think is tying businesses up in knots and, and it, it, it's quite difficult to understand. And I, I, I do understand that as well, but that's the bottom line. And I am happy to talk to anybody who um, and it has taken me a long time um, to get my head around this because I have been following this particular case through through the legal system. So it's it's kind of finally finally clicked and I do I do sympathise. But, you know, this is now the, the definitive definitive position. All right, moving on to the last case, and I'm pleased to say I'm looking like I'm on I'm on time. The case is uh, Mogan and Bradford teaching hospitals, and it is in relation to a redundancy. That's quite a strange and unusual set of facts. Um, and I had a few raised eyebrows as I was as I was reading through through the judgment on on this particular case. So this case, to put it into context, um, the teaching hospital identified that they needed to make some reductions in their staffing. There were two nurses at a particular level. Both were employed on fixed term contracts. One, which happened to be um, Ms Mogan, um, had been employed for longest, but her fixed term contract was due to expire during the course of when the, 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 the teaching hospital were looking at making the redundancy. The second individual had just um, completed their probationary period and their, their fixed term contract wasn't due to end for, for a considerable period of, or certainly for a period of, of, of time and, and longer than, than Miss Mogan. And what happened was the trust decided, yes, we need to make a redundancy. Yes, there's these two people in the pool. And the way that we're going to determine who is selected is we're going to choose the one whose fixed term contract comes to an end soonest, i.e. Miss Mogan. And that in turn determined that Miss Mogan was going to be the person who was made redundant. Now, this particular case um, considered the point at which Miss Mogan should have been consulted with before her decision, you know, the decision was taken to make her redundant. And that decision was who was whose fixed term contract came came to an end soonest. Now, I read through this case and I don't necessarily agree with 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 the conclusion, I have to say, but ultimately what this case says is. And it it's fairly, um, you know, sort of established law, consultation has to take place with an individual or unions or representatives of individuals at the earliest or at the earliest opportunity and when it can be genuine and meaningful in the sense that the individual can influence the outcome. In this particular instance, what the Employment Appeal Tribunal said was that that consultation should have taken place before the decision was taken that the use of the, the which fixed term contract came to an end first was going was determined to be the selection criteria um, in essence because that moved the pool from two the two nurses on the fixed term contract down to one and there wasn't any consultation about that decision with 
with Miss Mogan. And on that basis, the Employment Tribunal um, concluded, and I am, this is the bit that I'm surprised at, they concluded that that was not fair, but they then went on to conclude, actually, I don't need, well, what they said was, that's not fair, but the tribunal haven't reasoned why it's not fair. And then the EAT said, we don't, in effect, we don't need that. We can decide it was unfair. And basically the tribunal just needs to decide what the, what compensation that individual is entitled to. So from a practical perspective for you um, and appreciating that we are in difficult economic times and redundancy is something that businesses might well be thinking about and contemplating is the process that you follow the point at which you are consulting with individuals is a critical part of that process and if you get it wrong if you take you know the wrong decision at the wrong time you don't discuss with employees at the right time you can find yourself in a situation where the individual is challenging it and they challenge it successfully within within the employment tribunal. So please do, please do bear that in mind. And again, you know, if you if you are in that situation, we do have some packages that you can you can tap into or indeed you can get in touch with us and we'll we'll happily happily assist. OK, so that's the end of um, what I wanted to say. I know it's a little bit of a whistle stop tour and by by no means covers everything but I've, I've covered what I think is perhaps the most useful at, at this particular point particular point in time so very quickly um work it long are now on review solicitors and um I hesitate to say I am as well so if you have been are a client at the firm whether you've used myself or indeed any colleagues please do feel free to leave a review on review solicitors the links are the links are there we would very much appreciate your your feedback as we as we always do um so far i'm pleased to say that the feedback is is actually very 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 humbling to humbling to read also i've mentioned a, couple, a few times today we will be sending out updates as and when things are more concrete if I can put it like that um, and we'll be sending stuff out to the mailing list so if you want to get on to that please do please do um, contact events at beckettlong.co.uk also all of, of what I've been discussing today we can support your business under BLHR which is a fixed price um, HR legal service that we that we provide and it blends our advice from our HR advisor with the legal knowledge then and um, that, that, that we can we can provide as well. So if that's something you would be interested in, again, please do please do get in touch. We'd be delighted to to talk to you. We're nearly there, I promise. Um, survey as always for the Wednesday webinar. Please do please please do fill it in. We love to hear your feedback. We do take it into account and we've already had some great ideas around um, possible future events. So we will be looking through those and um, hopefully prioritising them in terms of what's going on in the world and also by by popularity. Also, next the next Wednesday webinar is by my construction colleagues. They'll be doing a, a review of um, construction law. And that's on the 2nd of, of November and you can see there there are other other topics there um, that whilst may not be of interest particularly to you do feel free to share it amongst your your network um, and you know hopefully something you know there might be something of interest either for you or, or your contacts so um one final thing, a recording is going to be sent out to you tomorrow. As I say, there will be links um, in due course to the various bits and pieces I've spoken about today. So I think that's enough from me and I will ask if there are any questions. And I can see that little orange blob, which is not a good sign.
Thank you, Julie. Um, we actually do have some questions. We have about 10 questions and about 10 minutes okay. left. So a minute of question, no pressure. OK, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have the first question is from George um, and he says, I know you aren't going to be drawn into conjecture. However, possibly unlikely, do you think the Equality Act will be impacted? Um, I think the Equality Act is. Well, I'll come at it from a slightly different way. Um, I can't see the electorate being particularly happy if the protections that are already in place under the Equality Act were to be um, wholesale removed or, or, or indeed adjusted. And I think actually, going way, way back now, I think the Equality Act goes further in a lot of instances than EU law required us to do. And I, I on that basis, that's a long winded way of saying I don't think the Equality Act is going to be impacted in any significant way. Great, thank you, Julie. Our next question is from Tiffany and she asks, could you please clarify when we may know if we don't need to do gender pay gap as we have 350 employees? Uh, Tiffany, I would say you work on the basis you are going to have to do gender pay gap um, and that will be just trying to think what the dates are. I can't remember them off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, you work on the basis that it will apply to you unless and until you you hear otherwise. I'd like to say that you will hear otherwise sufficiently in advance for you not to be panicking around April um, of next year, but I, I can't promise. OK, our next question is from Stephen and he asked um, for casuals, not TTO or fixed term staff on variable hours. Does the uh, Brazil judgment now apply to their holiday pay calculation as in using a calendar formula rather than the percentage formula? The short answer is yes, and I know I'm not going to be popular um, with that. Um, there are lots of different things to be taking into account in 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 terms of whether as a business you decide to go down the, the I'll, I'll call it the Harper Trust case because I vary my pronunciation of bras will varies depending on what second it is um I I mean we're we're advising clients both in terms of moving to the Harper Trust approach and also some clients are choosing to stay to stay with the percentage percentage approach because actually some workers um, we found don't want to move to the to the Harper Trust approach because in some instances they might be work, worse off. OK, I'm actually just going to skip to the other questions we had on this case and then we'll come back yeah. to the, the long COVID okay. ones. Um, so uh, we had one from somebody anonymous who asks if this applies to a zero hours worker who might only work for one week in a year. In theory, it does. Um, but again, similar to the to the um, casual worker, you know, there's, there's lots of different things to be thinking about and weighing the balance as to which which approach a business might decide decide to go. But if if they remain on the books, in theory, this case could could apply to them. OK, and actually we had another similar question that says logically that could result um, in somebody employed for five weeks of the holiday year entitled yeah. to five plus weeks of holiday. And they just asked for a reconfirmation of that case name so they could look it up. Yeah, so it's Harper, um, Harper Trust and Brazil. And when the recording goes live on the website, there is going to be a link to an article. And I think there is an article on our website already, actually, um, on this. And I, in fact, I know there is. Um, so if you just Google or just look through our website, it's on it's on there. Um, but I mean, I think it was the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal in particular referenced the cricket coach 
who might actually only work for a very short period of the year, but was still engaged by the by the school for the entire for the entire calendar for the entire holiday year, and that coach was would have been still entitled to 5.6 weeks. They did say we know that means that they get a windfall in comparison to full time employees, but they said ultimately that's what the working time regulations um, allows them to have. And this is one of the areas to kind of link back into what might come up in the future. This is one of the areas where I'm expecting there to be some attention. And actually, you know, as, as I've said previously, what attention is very, very long overdue on some aspects of the holiday entitlement. In my view. OK, thank you, Julie. Um, and moving on to the long COVID questions, um, we have a couple we could probably actually group together here. So one from Sam who asked, have there been any other long COVID cases yet or just this Scottish one? And also George who asked, what was the person actually dismissed for? And that was in relation to the long COVID case. OK, um, I'll take the first question. Sorry, the second question first. The case actually isn't very clear um, and I'm reading between the lines, but I, I get the impression that they weren't happy with with performance. Um, and as, as I think I mentioned during the during the presentation that the case wasn't the best, the, you know, the judgment wasn't the best written. Um, Sam's question. Yes, there was a second case and again it was a Scottish case. I'm going to quickly see if I can find the name. Um, so there was a, a it was a case of Burke. Um, I can't remember what the employer name was, but if you Google Burke B-U-R-K-E um, long COVID, I'm fairly confident and obviously other search engines are available. Um, I'm fairly confident you'll be able to that that will be the first case. That will be the first thing that will pop up for you. OK, hey, and uh, another one relating to long COVID is if an employee is on long term sickness paid by an insurance policy, critical care, are they still eligible to holiday pay? Yes. OK. And so we just had one last one coming in here on the Brazil case. Can we address Brazil by employing part year? You can. Um, however, if and Brazil was a part in effect a part year contract, if you are saying, I mean, even if you did it on a fixed term contract of nine months of the year, but there was an agreement that you were then going to employ them nine months of the year in the following year, it's possible that they would bridge that gap and be able to say, actually, I'm engaged for the full year. Um, it's not it's not necessarily a foolproof plan, I'm afraid. Thank you, Julie. That's all our questions answered for today. All in good time. So I'll hand over to you to. There was, there was <laughs> one way that answer there. They wasn't there. So there was, yeah. Clawed right. back some time. Thank you. Yes. I'll hand over to you Absolutely. to finish the webinar. All right. Thank you, Katie. OK, so hopefully everyone has found that interesting. Um, as I say, there will be a record recording going out in the morning. Please do keep your eye on the, the page for the recording and we'll we'll upload the articles relative to to what I've been speaking about and you can delve into the into the detail a little bit more. There'll be links in there for the guide that I've mentioned as well. So um, if you haven't been able to to locate them on the web as I've been talking, they'll be they'll be there um, for you to for you to access. So it remains for me to thank you for tuning in. Um, please do get in touch if you have any questions I'll quickly just move my details along I'll be happy to speak to anybody as indeed would any of the team and I'd be very delighted to talk to you about BLHR or indeed you know if you have any individual contact or whatever that they're experiencing difficulties again very very happy to to talk to them so thank you very much have a lovely rest of the evening and thank you for for watching